Hi guys, I wanted to make a video talking about running DNA Center on Proxmox. And I want to start this off by saying I would not do this in production. Uh, the reason I'm making this video and the reason I wanted to try it is is for people studying for their CCIE and for people maybe doing some proof of concept testing. I wanted to just see if it was possible. I assumed it was because the cloud version of DNA Center runs on AWS or Azure and they have KVM based hypervisors and stuff. So I figured it wasn't undoable. It there is a there are a few things that that may not work correctly, um, but we'll talk about that. So the the first thing I want to talk about is is the method of installation that you use. So a lot of people are are looking at the new version of the the virtual appliance. So they're going to software.cisco.com and they're actually this is faster. Um, they're going here and they're looking here and here and they're downloading not witness they're downloading the ones with the va after them which is an ova file if you're running vmware in your home lab you might be fine with the ova um if you're running proxmox do not use the ova um the reason being is OVA support in, Prox in Proxmox sucks. Um, basically, it, it parses the OVF file that's inside of the OVA. You have to manually extract the OVA. You have to untar it. And then you have to import everything individually manually. So at that point, why not just build the VM yourself? So if you're using... Um, Proxmox, or even if you're using VMware, I would stay away from this. People seem to think that it uses less resources. I, I don't think it does. What I would recommend, at least at the time of recording, which is July 2024, I would recommend 2355, um, definitely nothing lower, but 2355 and download the ISO installer. Um, when you get that installer, if you're running Proxmox, there's some really weird stuff in Proxmox. I'm going to talk from a VMware perspective because I'm assuming most of the people watching this are used to VMware and not Proxmox. I sure was. Um, if you look at, say, local LVM, there's no um, there's no place to put ISOs here. Now, there's a place to put ISOs here. What you have to do is add storage. I believe doing all this off the top of my head, and I've only done it once. Believe what you have to do is it's in here somewhere you add a you add another basically a directory and that directory exists on the on the proxmox host so basically my data store is called dna center so that's honestly if you're familiar with linux it'll you'll feel at home it's it's in dev and then it's the name of the the data store um I have it nested a little bit. It honestly doesn't need to be this nested. Um, so I, I transferred the ISO here. I would advise against uploading it in the web UI. In VMware, uploading it in the web UI seems to work okay. I don't know what Proxmox uses to upload. I kept getting failures around the 70 to 80% mark. I don't know if that's a limitation of my browser, if something's just timing out. Um, it could be my computer as well. Um, but I had much more luck um, SFTPing it right via MOBAX term to the Proxmox host. If you put it in the folder that your ISO images are mapped to, it will just show up here. Excuse me. So if your ISO images are on, say, local, you can see there's not enough space here. And I even expanded my local there's not enough space here to put the DNA center uh, ISO file because it's it's like 30 gigs. So what you'll have to do is what I did was I made a v, I made a, a directory on the data store I was installing DNA center onto and then I mapped that here and then I put the ISO in here via SFTP. And there's videos on that. I would just if if you're um local isn't big enough i would say just do a google search for change iso path in proxmox and then find that path in an, in an sftp browser and upload it there once you get it uploaded you can make the virtual machine what i'll do is i'm gonna actually 
I wanted to I wanted to touch on some of the spec stuff first. So that's why I left this my my proof of concept one running. Because some people will be like, oh, I'm going to try this on my laptop. My laptop has 64 gigs of RAM. I should be fine. Or my laptop has 128 gigs of RAM. If maybe it's a desktop. They think they'll be fine. So I want to show you these graphs. This is, you know, when I created the VM. And then this is going through the installer. And this is when the containers were initializing. So if you look at the peak, 142 gigs of RAM is peak during install and then it idles around 135 136 so if you don't have 150 gigs of ram you're not going to make it through install gracefully you might like your way through maybe maybe it'll use a swap file or something but the same thing with cpu people will be like oh i have 20 cores so if you look this is using 50 percent of 40 cpus and they're pretty decent cpu cores too um, and that's another thing. Everybody asks me, oh, how many cores do I need? A core is not, a, a core isn't a core. A core from this CPU is not the same as a core from this CPU. You know, if you have 40 cores at one speed, it might be equivalent or almost equivalent to 20 cores at another speed. And I, I know they're not equivalent because of um, the way the actual software will load balance between the cores and single threaded stuff. But what I'm telling you is there's no way to know. There really is no way to know unless you use a CPU that I have used or that someone else has used, then I can comment on it. Now, what I'll say is I ran the same, um, I, I purposely ran this test on the same server that I ran VMware with DNA Center on it because I wanted to do a side-by-side -side comparison of performance and install time. And they were pretty on par with each other. I didn't notice a difference in install time. Um, unfortunately, I didn't time the VMware one, so I didn't bother to time the Proxmox one. But you can kind of see um, this was wrapping up install. Um, but it, it does go through a lot of memory. It doesn't really pin the CPU as much as I thought it would, but it does use a lot of memory, especially when it starts those containers. What I want to do is walk through the install process, show you what you should do, show you how to create the virtual machine, um, and then I'm going to jump into the setup wizard of the one that I already created because I'm not going to wait for that whole thing to install again. So what we'll do, I'm still getting used to this. I don't think I like it. I think I will be going back to VMware simply because I have licensing. Um, I'd love to love this because I hate Broadcom, but unfortunately I don't. So if I go here, create, I may have to, okay, so here we go. So one of these I used, I wish it would tell me which one is. This one's my VMware install, this Micron disk. Um, I think this one's the one I haven't used yet. Um, let me see if there's a way to check. Okay, so I'm just going to install to local LVM because I don't want to risk overwriting my VMware install. I, I pulled most of the disks out that have important stuff on them. Um, but the OS disk is still in there because it's M it's M.2, it's inside the server. So let's do this. Let's create the VM. What I'll do is I will sort of take a snip of this hardware. And if you're wondering, this is the hardware that I have ran it with successfully on both platforms, VMware and Proxmox. And I've created multiple fabrics, and everything's been okay. I know people say you need more. And like I said, that might be because not all processors and RAM are created equal. But for me, this is what I've needed. So let's make a new VM. And we'll name it Virtual DNA Center 2. And then this is what I was talking about. So... 
download the ISO from Cisco, transfer it somewhere mounted to, on the server, and then enable ISO storage. Or enable ISO storage first for that folder and then drag it there, and then it will show up here. Maybe you'll get lucky enough and your default partition for ISOs will be big enough. I think it uses some sort of percentage of your boot disk. This, you don't have to change anything. The disk, you're, you're going to need... I don't know if you need 600 gigs. I would say 600 gigs is a safe bet. Which is another reason not to use the OVA. If you use the OVA, you need 2 terabytes. It provisions a 2 terabyte disk. You can't tell it not to unless you edit the XML or the OVF. It's, it's XML on the inside. Um, if you do that, I believe it's signed. I think it's cryptographically signed. So you'd probably need to disable validation or just delete the cert and accept that it's not validated. So the OVA is going to take more messing around with than just configuring the specs yourself. Okay, one socket, 40 cores. And this, um, 10 megabytes, I think I did. I think that's roughly. Okay, let's talk about networking. So, I thought I was going to have to switch this to Intel E1000. I didn't. I left it at Vert.io, and the data plane seems fine, and you can talk to the to the DNAC on both the interfaces, and everything's okay. So I'm going to leave it at Vert.io again, and I would say you can probably do the same thing. Um, the bridge is up to you. You're going to need two bridges. Um, I didn't create two bridges because I'm going to revert this host back to VMware, where my actual DNA center installs are for labbing. But the way DNA center works... Um, and if we actually wanted to talk about it, which I think is important because I think this gets glossed over too. So if this box is your DNAC, um, the DNA center is not VRF aware. So what I mean by that is you can only have one default route. In a lab, what I would do is have one interface go into something like CML. So let's say this big box is CML. In CML, this is going to be some sort of bridge, which you're going to then use in a topology over here. So that'll be connected like that. And then that bridge will be connected to maybe like a virtual iOS router. So obviously, you're going to have network over here. You're going to have network beyond this router in your topology. You're going to have border you're gonna have border nodes because the dna center sits in the shared services block so it's going to face a border node if you're doing sd access there's going to be routes down there that the dna center needs to get to i wouldn't recommend putting static routes in for all of those networks what i would recommend is putting a default route this way towards this interface IP, which doesn't even have to exist yet. Well, it should because it does a gateway check. But then you're going to say, okay, I have this other NIC here. What do I use that for? That should connect to the whatever network, whatever L2 domain you're going to manage the DNA center from. Because this network is not going to have a default route. You cannot have a gateway on two networks on a non vrf aware device. So what that means is Whatever subnet this interface is in, my computer needs to be in that same subnet so that we can talk without going through a default gateway. Or I guess you could throw a static router to and facing this way as well. But what I'm saying, moral of the story, your static route should face your lab, your actual SDA lab where you're going to be adopting devices into DNA Center. The other interface without the gateway should be your management network where your computer is going to sit. This is how I do it in my lab. Don't do this in production. This is this makes labbing super easy, though. Um, when I install it here, I'm not going to do that because I don't have this part hooked up to Proxmox. It's hooked up to VMware. I'm going to show you how to install it, but don't do as I do in the installer. Um, and I'll touch on this again there. But do this. If, if, if this is your intent, then that's what you want to do is have your gateway facing that way. You can only add one NIC here, I think. So what we have to do is after this is created, we'll click on it. And of course, what is our issue here? 
Oh, I didn't change the storage. So now what we need is, before I forget, we need another network device. Just gonna, you'll, you'll want to change this bridge, so you'll want to add a bridge and, you know, have those two separate networks. One that's bridged into your network virtualization and simulation platform, and one that faces your management network. But for now, I'm just going to do this to bypass the installer check. Everything else, I was surprised, because everything else sort of just works. Um... Yeah, I don't think I had to change anything else. So what we'll have to do, though, is shut this one down um, because I don't have enough resources on this box to run them both. So I'll be back when this one shuts down. Okay, so my first DNA center is shut down, and let's turn on the one we just made. The boot order in Proxmox is kind of weird. You can change it. Um, I just sort of cancel out of the Pixie boot if it happens. Okay, so this is the installer, um, basically the grub menu, the bootloader menu. You're always going to want to choose the first one. I haven't really found a reason to check the other ones. Here's another weird thing I found while this is loading. We'll probably see it soon anyway, but I'll talk about it now while we're waiting. I don't think whatever storage driver is used for the Proxmox like storage emulation is compatible with whatever sort of read-write speed testing DNA Center does on the installer side. Because if you're familiar with Cisco products, even ICE does this, um, they do like a read-write performance test to make sure you're within like the tax supported guidelines. When it does that on Proxmox, at least the time that I did it, it came back as zero read, zero write. Everything worked fine. It was obviously not true um, because I could see in the performance statistics of the VM what the actual read and write was but it thinks that the speed is zero, zero. So you have to sort of agree to something saying you're not within the supported guidelines, even though if you were, it wouldn't know. So this will sit here for a little bit. I wanna talk about the, the install process. So you're gonna get a uh, wizard, they call it Maglev. Um, it's also the user that you log in with if you log on to the shell. Um, you go through this wizard, which is basically like network interfaces, deployment type, DNS servers, NTP server. Once you hit enter, it goes through this command line. The command line, I don't know. I'd, I'd say it takes like 25 minutes maybe or for the for the progress bar to get across the screen. And then that that's over and you think, oh, I'm, I'm done. It's rebooting. It's rebooting into DNA Center. No, no. It's rebooting all right. But it's rebooting into the longer part of the installer. That part of the installer takes hours. I would say maybe four hours. I've seen six, though. I've seen six when the data store is co-located with other VMs. Um, so it all, like I said, it all depends, but just don't cancel it because what's going to happen is you're going to go through... Oh, here we go. So this is this, this actually read the, the megabits per second this time, which is weird because it didn't last time. Um, I'm still not within the requirements, but I'm going to hit ignore anyway. And then we want to start a cluster. It's going to hang for a second here, so I'll keep talking. Um, yeah, so once it reboots after that progress bar, you're going to get scrolling text. It sort of looks like, think like when Ubuntu is booting, when Ubuntu server is booting. You're going to get that sort of scrolling text. And what it's doing is it's extracting all of the containers that were packaged up and shipped to you, and it's installing them into Docker, and it's, you know, instantiating them, and then setting them up. That takes a long, long time. When that is done, it will reboot again, and then the UI will be ready. Do not log into the UI before that. I guess that'd be at that point the second reboot. Yeah, until after the second reboot. If you do, it's it's really weird. You're in sort of this purgatory where your changes aren't may not persist because not everything's up yet. Um, but I'll talk more about that when we get there. So for now, we're going to leave IPv4 mode and not enable FIPS mode. I have never seen a reason to bond the connection. Okay, so now is when that you know little MS Paint drawing I had came up. So network adapter one, enterprise. I really wish they showed you the MAC addresses here. I think they used to show you the MAC addresses somewhere in here so you could correlate the adapters in the hardware summary. Um, but I think in my case, they're actually in order. So what I'll do is I'm gonna give it a different IP address than my other DNAC. And then, so this, I would say this adapter, I've always used adapter number one, 
as the fabric facing adapter. I don't know if that's best practice. I know they sort of have the different designations, the enterprise, the cluster link, whatever. It's never really mattered in a lab to me which one I select for what. But like I said, keep in mind one default gateway. You get to choose which NIC you put the default gateway on. You can put static routes on the other one, but they have to be more specific static routes. So 10.3.101. And you can't just set up networking later. There are reachability tests. You have to have a DNS server, NTP server. So what I would do if I was installing this for real, and I wish I had time to do this for the video, but unfortunately I don't, is on the interface where your default gateway is facing. So on this enterprise, we'll call this the enterprise link. Before you get into CML on this V switch, because this should be virtual for you guys too, throw a Windows Server box. Put a Windows Server box there, make it a DNS server, make it an NTP server, and make it reachable. Because then you can pass the checks without connecting your lab to the internet, without putting a default gateway on this side. So put a Windows Server box here, make it your DNS server, because you're going to need it to be your DNS server later. You're going to need an NTP server. You might as well make it self-contained on one box, because if you're doing any sort of host onboarding where you need a CA or or Active Directory, you're going to have that anyway. For me, I'm just going to put in a publicly reachable DNS server, which I would not do if I was actually going to use this DNAC. Um, this is also the network that I'm going to have my um, default gateway on, which I already put in up there. You have to pick a cluster link, even if you're not deploying a cluster, just I throw it on the one that the gateway is on. Okay, so now we're onto the second network adapter. This is the adapter that is not facing the fabric. So this is facing away from the fabric towards your management PC. I'm just going to make up a subnet because it, I am not actually going to be using this DNAC. Once again, you got to choose your, your gateway there, which we've chosen for the other one. You don't need DNS servers. You can only have one cluster link, and we don't need static routes. This is going to be where the validation checks start. So if you're doing something like I had in that paint window, this is where you would need that VIOS router running um, to be able to pass that gateway validation check. So let me see how easy this is here. Okay, so the reason that I say to do the router thing and to have the fabric facing gateway and and all that stuff is because if this red box is your DNA center and say DNA center takes, I don't know, five hours start to finish to install. That's a long time, especially for somebody studying for their CCIE. You know, that that could be white papers read, that could be training done, that could be labs done. That shouldn't be time we're spending reinstalling DNA center over and over and over again. Install DNA center once or twice, maybe three times and keep it. Keep DNA Center running. You know, it's it, it's honor-based licensing. It's RT licensing. Um, you don't... It's not going to... No, there's no eval like ICE is. ICE, if you use it for more than 180 days, you're going to have to destroy it and recreate it and whatever or take snapshots. But with DNA Center, you can keep it. Take your DNA Center. One side goes to, you know, your your management computer right there. The other side goes into the fabric when you connect that so this would be a virtual uh, port group in VMware or, or a bridge interface in Proxmox when you put a router inside of CML you can make this router the dot one address in every lab you do because you have that that flexibility you can have the default gateway be in every one of your labs, different disjointed labs, and use the same DNAC. Obviously, you can only have one lab at a time. You're going to have an IP conflict on your virtual switch. But this is what I do. I have multiple CML topologies that use the same DNAC. They're just separate sites within that DNAC, and they all host a gateway for the cluster, the, for the, sorry, the, the fabric facing subnet. So that is sort of my mentality with this. Spend the least amount of time futzing with DNA center, installing DNA center, install it once and make it 
place it in a spot in your network where it's flexible. So now we're on to the cluster IPs, which we're not doing because we're not clustering. User accounts. So it's sort of like ICE in the fact that you have a system account, a Linux username and password, and you have a web UI username and password. Um, unlike ICE, that ICE will set them together in the install wizard, this sets them differently. You can make them different things from the start. I make them the same thing. Don't worry about any of the seed stuff unless you truly hate yourself and randomize your lab passwords. NTP servers. Uh, this is where that Windows Server box comes in that I recommend. If you guys are looking for architecture advice for your lab, I have another video on my channel. I don't have that many videos. It's easy to find. It's part two of my CCIE Transports Lab series where I deploy DNA Center, and I do it in the way that I recommend. Um, I, I set up the network interfaces. I set up the bridge. I show you how to pull it into CML. So that's sort of why I'm not doing this here. This video is just I wanted to show you guys it works on Proxmox. Um if you want to see high-level architecture or how to implement um, all the networking to pull it into your lab, I would recommend those videos. They are a bit long, though. So now it's going to do validation against the NTP server. I believe if this fails, you may be able to bypass it. Okay, container services subnet. If you know anything about what DNA Center looks like under the hood, it's like 150 to 250 containers. It's, 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 it's really, there's a lot there. So to orchestrate networking on the Docker side, they let you define a container subnet, which has basically all the different containers communicate over this subnet. This subnet cannot be used anywhere else in your network. You can see why. I mean, if, if a container tries to talk out to this IP, it's not going to get out of the cluster. It's going to remain in the cluster because that subnet lives there. So I always leave this default. I mean, if you're using that in your network, you probably have bigger problems. Um, this is where it's going to start actually doing stuff. So this is where I believe certificates start to get generated. Um, NTP and all those settings you just put in earlier start to get generated. So at this point, DNA Center is installing. It's going to go through this progress bar that's on our screen right now. I would say that takes probably about a half hour. Then it's going to reboot. Then the big part of the install starts. That is where you know you have that four or five, maybe six hours of of waiting for containers to untar and import and start and configure. And since there's, you know, between like 150, 250 containers, it takes a long time. So I'm not gonna wait for all that to happen again. I'm actually just gonna kill this installer and we'll jump back to VDNAC1 that I installed this morning. Okay, I think my original DNA center is done booting back up. It's, um, it's kind of sad, but the way I know it's booted is because the RAM has gone back to 130 some gigs. There's really no way to know that it's booted. I think there might be a command in the Maglev shell. Um, but what we can do now is log in with the web user we created in the install wizard. It's going to ask us to change that. We're going to skip it because we just set it. And I'm going to skip that as well. Now we have to agree to terms and conditions. And then... Um, I'm not going to do the quick start. The reason why is because it's going to want you to discover devices and do all this other stuff that we don't need to do. The important part is, is that we can load things. So we can load the inventory list. We're not getting any red errors here which means that the relevant containers to feed us this data are here. Even though there's no data, we're not getting errors saying we can't find the data. Um, another good one, believe, is network hierarchy. Yeah, so we're not getting any red errors down in the corner saying we can't pull this data. Now, some of you may get a banner up top that says, like, automation and assurance services have been temporarily interrupted. We're working to restore services. What I believe that is, and I think this, this might be a maps error. I think, so that automation assurance thing, if you get it, what that is, is A, a I, my theory is those containers start last, the automation and assurance containers, which sort of makes sense. Secondly, I think they're the first that get starved of resources. So if you're seeing that banner constantly, it probably means you need more RAM or CPU. I know when my first go at this, um, I saw that when I was instantiating my first fabric site. 
it didn't do anything. Um, but those containers crashed and had to restart because they didn't have, uh, they were starved of resources is at least my, my theory there. But it does look like, I mean, this is aside from that map, what I think is a maps error. It does look like everything is fine. If we go to system 360 and we look at the services and we sort of sort by health here, everything's up. Um, this is where you'd see, you know, if, if you had resource starvation or anything like that, this is where you'd see it in System 360. So it looks like we're good. I'm going to end the video here and I'm going to sort of segue into, you know, that, that part two of my um, CCIE transport series where I show you how to link the DNA center into your lab i think that you should watch that first at least the relevant parts of it before you go to deploy this if you haven't deployed it in your lab yet because there are some gotchas and like i said reinstalling dna center is a, a costly experience from a time perspective so you never want to have to do that and i know we're getting this error but since all the services are running i know it's not resource related um, it may be that everything's not up yet, but given we're not getting f data fetch errors, I'm going to say this is a, a good install. And my first install was a good install, but I did wait longer after the, the, the box came up um, before I started my validation. But like I said, I'm going to end the video here. Feel free to reach out with me to reach out to me with any questions. Like I said, I can't really answer the, will this server run DNA Center? I don't want to say yes and then have it not work because my guess is as good as yours. The only thing I can tell you that can run DNA Center are the two that I run in my lab, which are UCS C220 M6s with 192 gigs of RAM and 40 cores of CPU. Those are the only servers I'm willing to say will run it because I know they will run it. I've done it. I know some people use Dell 730s. Um, so anything, you know, 730 or probably even a 630 would, would be okay. Um, and, and people ask me too, is there any reason I use UCS? No, they're just what I have. Um, it's not, I mean, I'm sure from a compatibility perspective, it's probably better, but you're virtualizing it anyway. So, I mean, it's, it's abstracted enough that it probably doesn't make a difference. So I hope you guys got something from this video. Thank you for watching and I will see you later.